Are you ready to meet the most powerful single board computer on the market? And by powerful, I mean 12 cores, 16 threads, 16 gigabytes of memory, two and a half terabytes of NVMe storage, dual two and a half gigabit ethernet, dual 10 gigabit USB, and dual Thunderbolt 40 gigabit ports. I'll give you a full introduction to the system and run complete benchmarks on it right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to take the Latte Panda Sigma for a spin and see how it stacks up against true desktop systems. It's billed as the smallest and most powerful complete Windows 11 PC, and from what I've seen so far, it more than lives up to those promises. As you'll see shortly, it even outperformed my M1 Mac Mini. When Latte Panda approached me about reviewing the board, I was a little dubious as product reviews are a bit outside my wheelhouse. But once I heard the specs, and after they dropped the phrase fully hackable on me, I was intrigued. The fact that the board is fully hackable from an electronics perspective was the killer feature for me. It has a GPIO header with more than a dozen pins that you can control, and better yet, it's fully compatible with the Arduino framework and even its IDE. We'll even try coding up a simple Arduino sketch and uploading it to the board today. That all said, I don't do normal product reviews where I lavish praise on this week's highest bidder. Rest assured that no money changed hands, they didn't have any input on the contents of this video, and they didn't get to see it in advance. And that means I'm going to test the weird stuff, like can the Thunderbolt 4 ports be used for video? Can I add my own SSDs? Can the board be powered off USB-C alone? How much power does it draw? Can I connect it to an external GPU? Can I run multiple monitors? Can it handle the Heaven benchmark? How does it fare with Geekbench versus a Mac Mini? And so on. But before we get too far into the weeds doing all those things, let's meet the Latte Panda with a patented Dave's Garage product unboxing. All right, let's have a look inside the box. The Latte Panda Sigma comes custom matched to my watch, it appears. So we'll just pop it out of the box and see what's inside. Pretty nice packaging for a single board computer, I might add. Fancy Latte Panda Sigma logo. Inside we have a little frame that frames our single board computer and the power supply, I presume, is right below this. Let's lift out the cover plate and see what's going on inside. Looks like it comes with a branded power supply, which is always nice. So I'll set that aside. And we can take out the Latte Panda Sigma and set it aside for a moment as well. Still nicely wrapped in its anti-static bag. We'll pull out the styrofoam layer here and see what's below it. All right, looks like we've got power cables from various different formats, including European and some other ones that I'm not familiar with. Let's see what all we've got here. We've got small dryer, East Germany, I think. I'm kidding. I assume that's European. And here we go, the American. So I'll set that with the power supply. We've also got some stickers that came with it and a little instruction book that we can take a look at. Of course, I'm not gonna read through this right now, but I will flip through it so you get kind of a rough indication of what kind of information you get besides specs instructions, how to install a drive, how to jumper it, what the ports are, all that. Hope you got that. This looks like one of those strips you would put on an SSD to sandwich it up against the heatsink plate on the back, so I presume that's what it is. Got a couple of Wi-Fi antennas and some standoffs. Let's pull the Sigma out of its wrapper and we'll see what it looks like. All right, so as you can see, it's got a lot of connectivity on it. On the one side, it's got two USB ports and a Thunderbolt 4 port. It's also got a power switch and a power LED. On the back side, we've got a couple of 10 gigabit USB ports, dual 2.5 gigabit NICs, an HDMI port, another Thunderbolt 4 port, a power barrel jack adapter, and then some expansion. On the left-hand side, you'll see there's a whole set of GPIO pins that can be used for programmatic hacking. The back plate of the board is steel or aluminum, and it serves as a heat sink for the SSDs. And now the best part, what comes with a Latte Panda? Why, of course, it's a Latte Panda, or a Panda with a Latte. He's actually pretty cute. I think we'll uh, put him up on the shelf. Now, one thing I tend to take seriously because I don't want my house to burn down are power bricks. And in this case, we're looking at a branded power brick made by Delta, and it is in fact UL listed, which is of course very nice to have. It's a 19 volt power brick, and it appears to run up to 90 watts. The Latte Panda Sigma is available as a bare board or with SSD storage and Wi-Fi built in. The one I received had a 500 gigabyte SSD already installed, but a wasted M.2 port is a shame, so I decided to install a two terabyte Samsung 980 Pro along with it to bring it up to two and a half terabytes total. 
The board has four slots on its backside. One was used for Wi-Fi, one for the factory drive, one for the drive I was about to add, and that still leaves one spare slot. I know, kind of a waste, but... Okay, let's bust out the Phillips screwdriver, pull off the back plate, and have a look at where the SSDs and the Wi-Fi card go. As noted earlier, this back plate serves as a heat sink, and so you want to leave it in place, I believe, as long as you've got SSDs on the back. With the screws removed, I can pop the plate off. And here you can see I've already installed a 980 Pro from Samsung, which is a 2 terabyte unit. That's in addition to the Western Digital Black SN770, which is the 500 gigabyte drive that it came with. Adding the Wi-Fi antennas is a bit of fiddliness here that we've got to push it down in the center once we get it aligned properly. Let's see if I can get that to go and stay on. There we go. And the second one, do I win? Yes. Now, they don't give you much length here to route these, so I'm just going to wrap them around to the other side. Put the plate back on and then see where we can stick those Wi-Fi pads. I don't really like sticking them here on the metal, but... Uh, Hopefully it will not cause any interference. Now I actually don't know the implications of sticking these to a metallic surface, so we're just going to have to boot up the Wi-Fi and see what the reception is like. And with the antennas connected, it's jumped from one bar to a full five bars of service on the Wi-Fi, so it looks like they're in a fine location, at least for my purposes. Now it's time to put those SSDs to the test to make sure they're getting all the PCI lanes and bandwidth that they need to perform correctly. For that testing, I'm going to use Crystal Diskmark, and we'll run it on both the factory Western Digital Black Drive and on the Samsung 980 Pro that I've added. Let's check out the results. So for my test bench, I've just hooked up a keyboard and a mouse, as well as USB-C input power and HDMI output to the monitor, because this monitor doesn't have a USB-C input like my main dev station. So, it's simply getting power over that Thunderbolt port from the external GPU, which I don't have a driver installed for yet. And just for completeness, I confirmed that both ports allow you to power the board. I've now done it off both sides, so you can also tell that both work for USB-C video. Time to run some disk benchmarks. Now, the Western Digital 770 that we're going to be testing is rated at 5150, and we come very close to that at 5056, within a 1% or 2% of air. And the right is also up to spec. Holds up nicely for the second batch and then falls off as you expect as the write sizes get smaller and smaller. Either way, 5 gigabytes a second reads and 4 gigabytes a second writes. Fairly impressive for a single board computer, at least I think so. Next, let's test my installed Samsung 980 Pro 2 terabyte drive. Comes in a little slower at 3424 and the reads hold up perhaps a little better until the very smallest reads. Writes are closer to what the Western Digital was able to do, but still 3454. Now, I'm of the opinion that really large transfer rates for really large transfer sizes is really only useful to you if you're moving around huge files like 4K video files. Since I don't think you'd be editing 4K video files on a single board computer, it's not clear to me that these are even useful numbers, but hey, there they are. Next, I want to benchmark the CPU and the integral GPU, as well as to see if I can get it to work with an external GPU. We'll also measure power draw through both the USB-C ports and the barrel jack adapters to see if it makes any difference in peak power consumption or provides any limitation if you're not using the barrel jack. We'll use Geekbench 6 for the testing and we'll put those results in context against a Ryzen 5950X, a Threadripper 3970X, and an M1 Mac Mini. We'll also put it to the test with Cinebench to see how the multi-core performance stacks up. Next, we'll bust out Geekbench 6 and let it run through both the CPU and the GPU benchmarks. We'll see how it does compared to a 5950X, a Mac Studio, and a Threadripper 64 thread machine. We'll see how that compares to other systems in a moment, but just from seat of the pants, I think that's pretty much comparable to the 5950 and probably not far behind the Mac Studio. Now, of course, that's single core because multi-core wouldn't be a fair comparison because the Mac Studio has 20 cores and the 5950 has 16 cores and Threadripper has 32 cores. So we'll see their multi-score cores being quite a bit higher, but let's... uh keep our eye on the single core score and see how it compares. Next, let's run the compute benchmark so we can see what the 3D graphics performance is expected to be like. And as it wraps up and posts a score of 13941, that's a score that I would definitely call Rocket League and Minecraft. So those kind of games are probably going to run pretty well on this machine, but uh, you won't be playing Cyberpunk at 4K. 
And since I was powering the machine over USB-C, I was curious to see just how much power it was actually taking and if USB-C power was any kind of limitation on the machine's maximum power consumption. The first thing I did then was to spin up Prime 95 on all cores so that the CPU was maxed. And with no GPU action and just CPU, I'm just right over the edge of 60 watts, but let's say 60 watts. That seems to be the max consumption. And with the CPU and system pulling 60 watts, let's see what happens if we fire up the GPU and get it to do some work at the same time. So with Prime 95 still using every cycle available in the background, we're going to run Geekbench again, this time running the GPU compute to see if it pulls any more power. And surprisingly, no. So to make sure that it's not anything to do with power supply, I'm going to step up to the 140 watt adapter from my Apple MacBook. Now, as you can see, it pulls about one and a half watts until I power it on. Once I do that, it should ramp up here pretty quickly. There we go. So when the machine is reasonably busy, it pulls about 30 watts and down from there, depending on how active the machine is. And to give you some sense of what the GPU is like, it's running this at 60 to 70 frames per second. So as you can see, it's not helpless, not by any means. So it has reasonable graphics capabilities, but it's not going to be like a Mac Studio that has a significantly more powerful GPU built right into the CPU. This one's built into the CPU as well, but it's far more uh, laptop style than desktop style, I would say. And now to make sure that USB-C power being supplied was not a limitation on the machine, I've plugged in the 90 watt adapter that it comes with, and I've got a monitor plugged directly into the wall here so we can see what kind of power it pulls from the wall. It's going to be about 5 to 10 watts of overhead at any one time. And now that I've got Prime 95 running, I can see it's pulling 70 watts. So that's probably 60 plus 10 overhead for being a power supply of this nature. And with the GPU fully engaged as well as the CPU, we're still at just over 60 watts. So we're right in that range. Next, I'm going to move on to Cinebench R23, which is probably not a very favorable test for a computer like this because it really focuses on multi-core performance. Now, of course, this does have 12 cores, 8 performance, and 4 economy, and so it is, of course, going to do much better than your typical single-board computer, but compared to a higher-end desktop-class computer, I don't think it's going to do that well, but we'll see where it lands once it's done calculating. Now, I'm going to leave Cinebench to run here for quite a while in order to really heat soak the machine and see what it is able to sustain for clock rates once it's fully saturated. And to find out, we're going to rely on your friend and mine, Task Manager. Where's Task Manager? Here we go. There we can see it's still at all cores at 3.09 gigahertz. So that's pretty good for a 1.9 base clock, I figure. And now let me hit the turbo button on it. And uh, no, actually, I'm fast forwarding this footage because it takes a little long to get through all the passes that it needs to in order to complete the benchmark but it should be done about now. And what do we wind up with? And it looks like a fairly respectable score of 10,310. With the benchmarks complete, it's time to put them into some context. To provide that info, I ran the same testing on three additional systems, an M1 Mac Mini, a Ryzen 5950, and a Threadripper 3970 workstation. Let's have a look at the results. Now the GPU side is where the Sigma struggles a bit, at least compared to modern dedicated GPUs. The Sigma posts a score of 13383, which is still about 70% of the GPU horsepower of a M1 Mac Mini, which scores 19826. In comparison to the higher end fare, the Mac Ultra approaches 100,000 and the Threadripper's NVIDIA 4080 rockets past them all at 227,370. Still, the Sigma has no pretensions of being a graphics and gaming powerhouse, so the real question is whether the integral GPU is sufficient for your needs. As long as those needs don't include intensive video editing or cutting edge gaming, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at just how well it does. Just for fun, I plugged in an external GPU via Thunderbolt 4 to see if it works. This limits the number of PCI lanes to the four that are available on the cable, but it still posted a score of almost 70,000, which is five times faster than the internal GPU. Granted, I'm not sure why you'd buy a tiny single board computer and then anchor it to a large external enclosure like the Razer eGPU housing I'm using, but it's nice to know that the technology works and is available if you ever need it. On the CPU side of things, the single core speed is quite impressive, turning in 2073 just shy of the M1's 2325. In fact, it handily beats the Threadripper 3970X in single core performance. And it even turns in more than 50% of the Threadripper's immense multi-core score, posting an 8867. That also puts it ahead of the M1 Mini. 
The Ryzen 5950, which boasts 16 cores and 32 threads, also pushes past it at 11873. As a final test, I wanted to vet their claim of being a hackable desktop. To that end, the Arduino IDE already came pre-installed on the machine and was already set up for the Latte Panda Sigma in the board options. I typed in the classic Blinky sketch, which simply turns the built-in LED off and on with a delay, and it compiled and uploaded and worked perfectly on the first attempt. I noticed that it was uploading to COM3, so it looks like the Sigma presents itself in such a way as to be trivially programmable using the Arduino framework. With a dozen or so GPIO pins fully under your control, I think it makes a compelling example of a very powerful Arduino host. Taken as a whole then, the performance of the Latte Panda Sigma is impressive when you consider it for what it is. A single board computer that's a fair bit smaller than a Mac Mini, but still outperforms it in multi-core processing. Now the GPU may not be a powerhouse, but it's comparable to what you'll find in most non-gaming laptops, so it's more than enough to do all of your desktop computing tasks. By the way, if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. If I see a sudden spike in subscriptions, then I know that there's an interest in this type of content, and I'll make more of it. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime, in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.